Welcome to the Living Consciously TV show coming to you live from our Denver, Colorado studios. I'm your host and moderator, Coach Steve Toth, and our theme today is, I know something is off, but I don't know what it is. And it certainly is true for me as well. So it's a reality show today, folks. <laughs> and so let me, <laughs> let me introduce you to our guest cast as well as our entire cast for the show today. And our guest cast is Lee Gerdes. He is the CEO and founder of Brain State Technologies, and he's joining us from Arizona. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's fantastic to have you back. And we also have uh, Jamie Lerner. Uh, she is part of our Self Evolution cast, and she's joining us from Chicago. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Awesome. And then also Ninon de Rosa. She is joining us from, well, she's part of our Self Evolution uh, cast as well, and she's joining us from that funky town called Las Vegas. Oh, it is funky, but it's great. <laughs> it's, good to, it's good to be here. And, and I, think, I think there are a lot of people in Las Vegas, uh, more than probably anywhere else, where they are feeling that there is something off, but they don't know what it is. Well, yeah, there's definitely something <laughs> off. I'm going to tell you something that's really off. There's 7,400 people in Vegas that do not have their electricity turned on. Oh, Did, wow. How come? Did they have a... Hello, there's no money. They haven't paid their bills. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. Uh, so talk about uh, the lights of Vegas. <laughs> the lights of Vegas. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm. All right. Wow. And we also have... Me. Janet. Janet <laughs> Cook. Janet Cook uh, is joining us here in the studio. So she's here with me. And, and I came she's all the way... from Aurora. I came all the way in. from Aurora. Right. Exactly. And she's part of our health and wellness evolution cast. So welcome, everybody, to the show. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. All right, so the opening question is for Lee, as always. So I'm thinking that um, I want to run this by you, Lee. Uh, it seems to me that now, based on what you're up to, uh, we have some, we seem to have some, some science to uh, how to be awake and how to be conscious. A am, I, am I not too far off? Correct. <laughs> and I, that's, a fan that's fantastic news. And so I think my opening question would be is to uh, what is really brainwave optimization uh, so that our, we can bring our viewers up to date? Well, first, it is a matter of looking at the brain and measuring it to see how it's functioning. It functions with electromagnetic energy. And so we can measure that electromagnetic energy from the surface of the brain by placing a sensor on the scalp. At one time, we could measure it in seven frequency bands, but today we can measure it in 48,000 frequency bands. And so we can see it in a very granular way. Um, and so what we do is the, the brain is a, a parallel processor, um, like a two computers working at the very same time on the receiving the very same information, so that if one goes down, the other one can pick up with, without losing a beat. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so um, the brain is exactly that. And it has two hemispheres, and those two hemispheres have to be in communication with each other all the time. And as they do, um, you know, processing is um, the most fantastic thing we can imagine because it is what we imagine. However, if there is a trauma, then there is a symmetry or imbalance in those two sides. And if the two sides are imbalanced, they don't communicate as well. And when they don't communicate as well, there is a complication or a compromise of life somehow, depending on which lobes we're looking at, there's a compromise of life somewhere. So what we do is measure those functioning lobes. We do it with sensors, we do it in about 30 minutes, and we find out where asymmetries are. Now, understanding, please, that the brain is the smartest thing that we know of in the universe, <laughs> given that that's all we have to use to go on. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the, uh, what we see there is we, we know that a balance works better, and we're going to try to get that brain to balance itself. You know, when you have, you remember where you put something, hopefully, um, uh, you put your car keys, you remember how to, uh, um, you know, make coffee or whatever, 
uh, you, you have memories. And the brain has memories too. It, me it remembers trauma. And if there is a lot of trauma in a life, those traumas add up like a like liquid would add up in a container. Mm -hmm. um, Can you give an example, Lee, what a, what a trauma is? What are you referring to? Is it psychological, physical, emotional? It's all, all of the all, all of the above. All mm -hmm. above. Yeah. It's any and the it's it's the the brain determines it, and the brain can determine it out of nothing at all. For example, um, we had a woman who, as a young girl, was made to run in her go to go into a dark room to go to bed, and she was. We saw a lot of fear in a certain area of the brain, and we asked her if early childhood she had a lot of fear. She said no. Great family, et cetera, et cetera. But then she remembered she had to go into this dark room every night, and she was absolutely certain that there was something, you know, in the corner. There was a monster in the corner, right? Now, was there a monster in the corner? No. But she believed there was, and so she would run into her room, she would jump under the covers, get into a fetal position, and there she would, they would find her in the next morning. So she went through that in childhood, and that fear caused, that fear was traumatic wasn't real, but it was traumatic. Yeah. So whenever the brain thinks that the organism's threatened, its first job, and its first and foremost job, is to keep us alive. And it responds exceedingly well for, to do that. So when we see asymmetries, what we have to then do is we have to encourage the brain, we have to let it see itself, so it can see these asymmetries and find a way to then balance itself. Lee, I'm uh, really curious, how would your process work on a stroke victim? I'm very, very, very well. Yeah, go, go ahead, because a stroke usually is like one part of the brain and it has lack of oxygen and it'll have multitude of issues afterwards. So I'm really curious when you talk about the symmetry, about the balancing of this technology, how will that help a stroke victim? But you see, a stroke victim, depending on the situational um, experience of that victim, that, that person can lose some uh, neurons in the process, lose some connections. Okay. Um, and if they do, then the brain has to make up for that. It, and it can. It, it can. happens that it you, can. Oh, it cannot or can't? can't? It can. I can't. Okay, good. All right. Uh, sometimes it can't, it can't do it as well as it did before. It has to have workarounds where it has to go to place one, two, three, where before it just went to one, three. Make sense? Right. It kind of does like uh, the body can heal itself. It has the ability. So what I'm hearing is it'll just regenerate new connections for that. Basically, yeah. Okay. And it's not unlike a computer network, which as a geek, you know, I really like. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, uh, and so what we do is we, we try to get that brain to engender that balance or that uh, balance, what we say, get rid of the asymmetry and harmony, proportionation of frequency range from the top to the bottom and every lobe. And we do that by showing it itself and we use sound to do that. Like you had two tuning forks, you hit one of them and then the other one pick it up then stop the first one and the other one still, then, then they start a resonance loop. That's what we do with the computer and the brain. So I'm also, I have another question, sorry. So, because I, I really loved the last time you were on the show, it was very educational for me and the viewers. So my question is from a person as a body person, a body worker and, and where my training and my skill and my abilities are, how do you include the body into the process? Because scientifically proven, the memories, the trauma, the emotion, what you talk about when you're looking at the brain, they also are, reside in every cell in our body. And that's how we move in the world. When we have a lot of trauma, we'll have heaviness in certain parts of our body. How do you include the body into your process? Or is your process strictly about the brain? Um. It's not strictly about the brain as such. Okay. Because the brain isn't alone. True. It runs However, everything. However, isn't the brain the interpreter? It runs everything we have. In an evolutionary system, the new uh, phases of evolution are always those that drive the phases before it. 
So in the brain, we know that the outer layer, the cerebral cortex, drives everything internally. We're learning a lot about that. Wake Forest has, uh, School of Medicine has proven now that the brain drives the autonomic nervous system, which is our internal nervous system that tells our heart to beat, tells us to breathe, you know, et cetera. So, and, and they just prepared a, a paper for that um, for the neurological conference in San Diego. Um, and Dr. Tegler, the principal investigator, is going to be the principal speaker at a, a conference of neurologists and from universities around the world uh, later in the year. Because what they found is, heretofore, people have looked at the autonomic nervous system as a physical response, which it is, but now they've proven that the brain is driving that physical response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, it interprets everything. No. So, it uh, so it's, yeah, it's really, it's really quite important. Um, in fact, I can uh, have a heart transplant, but not a brain transplant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Lee, my curiosity here is, um, I mean, obviously, you know, and everybody else, uh, most of the viewers, uh, that are returning viewers know that we are very much interested in consciousness and teaching people how to be awake and how to live in the present moment. And, and my motivation to find out more and more about this is how do we reach people with, uh, with this message um, and what we do on the show here, specifically on Living Consciously TV. So how do we, how do we interrupt people? Because most people are, and, and this is in reference to the brain, most people are run by their subconscious mind, not, not the conscious mind, right? So there's all this information in there and people are closed down and not open. So um, they, they, they seem to be open to commercial uh, media. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the subconscious mind is, is, is like looking at the media as a smorgasbord, and that's my experience. So the how easy do we, fix. <laughs> how do we, how do we so, so specifically if you could address, with, and, and, and I have the same, same concern with uh, life coaches because there, there are hundreds of thousands of life coaches around the world and they interested in helping people but my experience is if the person that wants to get life coaching is really not open and they are run by um, their subconscious mind the possibility of any life coach really getting getting to the matter <laughs> is no is no is zero yeah, it's nothing you have an opportunity, and, and I think the question about, um, you know, fr from a body worker perspective, say, you, you're working on the body, you're sending signals back to the brain. When you're working with an aroma, you're sending signals to the brain. When you're working with touch, when you're working with taste, um, when you're working with light, all of these things are sending signals to the brain. These are stimuli. So sometimes, I guess, um, we don't wake up until we get the appropriate stimuli. And, um, and that can happen in the morning, you know, too. If the alarm doesn't go off, we don't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really true. A question I wanted to ask you is that I just had a friend of mine here and um, she was telling me a little bit about her eating habits, and I was intrigued about it, and she was eating some pasta or something she was eating. She had the same thing for breakfast, for lunch, and dinner. <clears throat> and after about a couple of months of doing this every day, which I thought was hilarious because I thought, this is not good for her system, why didn't, her, and, or why didn't she realize that this was really no good to her system because she got very, very sick after this? Why wasn't she conscious of of her brain or of our conscious telling her not to do this and the reaction afterwards, this would happen. I can harm myself. I've got that, I've got that opportunity. Okay. Nobody can change that. And so um, when, when, we, when we see the incredibly increased suicide rate for vet, vet, vets coming back now, um, we, we don't understand, you know, these are young men and women who are so incredibly capable on the one hand, mm 
Mm-hmm. What hap- what's happening? Well, what's happening, we've seen, is that there's a very distinct, actually, pattern in the brain that causes that brain to uh, look at hopelessness and self-harm. Yeah, you okay. can You can talk to it as long as you want. You can encourage it as much as you want. You can bribe it as, as much as you want, but you cannot change it very easily, very readily. It is a hard, it is a difficult process, unless and until you can get it to balance itself. And then it, bam, it's over. It, it, it sees it. Okay. So, so, this is- so, so some people, you know, use, will eat erratically or un, unhealthfully. Mm-hmm. Some will use drugs or meds. Some will have um, behaviors that aren't helpful. That's like a cocaine addiction. Same thing. You, you can't stop it, right? Your brain is telling you you want it, you want it, you want it. Is... Your, your brain is trying to get itself balanced. And you are unbalancing it. <laughs> well, and with the, with the cocaine, it, it's, trying to, it's trying to take more so it can get balanced. That's all it's, it's trying working. to do. Just, yeah, no, just exactly. Work. Well, it actually, work. I guess it, I guess it does for a short time. <laughs> when Somewhere. when the, when your friend was eating the uh, gruel or whatever you what whatever it was. it was she was eating, yeah, continuously. <laughs> but I'm just trying to think: why wouldn't she have the sense enough or to have her brain enough to bring her back into to realizing that if I did eat this all the time, something's going to happen nutritionally in my body? But she didn't seem to get that. Somehow or other, the the brain, for whatever, based on whatever trauma, it was wired such that that's what it wanted. Well, I would like to uh, say that the most wonderful thing about your technology is that it doesn't matter why. It only matters that it is, and the opportunity to get back into balance is so... Um, it's so wonderful and empowering. And okay. so, so I was going to actually set that up, uh, Jamie. Oh, sorry. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't contain we myself. Just, this, this, this we could all be called want to set you up, Jamie. In, 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 in <laughs> patience. <laughs> okay, so, so I was going to set that up uh, so that Jamie, Jamie actually on our cast has, lives in Chicago, and she went to one of your offices and actually gone through the, the process uh, the assessment and the entire process for an entire mm-hmm. week. So oh, uh, let, let's start with just asking Jamie, and then you, you can kind of um, uh, jump in there, Lee. Uh, but did you have, Jamie, did you have a question like our theme that you felt that something was off, but well, you didn't know what it was? Uh, no, I saw the show, and I was so inspired um, okay. by the idea that um, no matter what the imbalance is, and it doesn't matter, um, that you could go and um, create balance and well-being. And so as a well-being therapist, I thought before I could recommend anyone else to do this, I need to do it for myself. And I was very excited, although I had no expectations. And I went and had the you know five days of brain training, and um, I was absolutely blown away in terms of what it did personally for me. And... Um, the endless possibilities that it offers. So what, uh, blew, you, what blew you away specifically? Well, <laughs> uh, just the idea that you could um, erase the emotional content of past events and then in the moment choose what and how you wanted to feel about whatever it is that was coming up. And I thought that in itself, first of all, it was very exciting. I didn't exactly believe that it was possible, but it was for me. Is there something uh, that you would be willing to share, something more concrete? Intimate. <laughs> doesn't well, have you to know, be, it, it have was. To be intimate. You, oh, well, this sounds very subtle, but this is when I knew it was actually working for me. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I am a very responsible person, but. I do not wear or did not wear my seatbelt. And I felt that that was always my choice as long as no one else was in the car, that I could personally make that decision for myself. No one was going to tell me to wear my seatbelt. And so... Although I have a hard time admitting that in public, I, I felt very comfortable even with that, that decision. Even that you were breaking, even that you were breaking, breaking the law. law. Even I never uh-huh. felt like it was some 
was a break in the law. So well, anyway. That's because I felt the same thing with that. I had exactly the same thing, Jamie. Okay, so. I could it, wear it. But I, it never really, I never thought much about it. it this, after the second day of brain training, out of nowhere, I found myself with my seatbelt on. Which yes. was so bizarre to me. <laughs> I was like, I was blown away. I, loved I was it. like, what <laughs> happened? And I realized there was no more rebellion or resistance. I was in balance. And I I just literally had to pull over and like do a check and make sure that like there wasn't someone else in the car with me. And that was the, that <laughs> that was put it the on for second you? day. Uh -huh. So something so small and so subtle. And to this day, I just naturally, I put my seatbelt on as if it's the most natural thing in the world. So that really was huge for me. Even though it sounds kind of silly, it was a big thing for me. Really what was big. Your greatest, what was your greatest challenge to this? Was there a challenge that for you? For this wearing the seatbelt? No, 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 no. For, for going to have to, to go for this well, test to go great, to the, What was the, the challenge? The greatest challenge for me was uh, on this end of the second day, or actually it was the third day when we had a two hour break, I was feeling so euphoric. And I came back and I said, this is it, I'm done, I'm ready to go home, we don't need to do any more here. I'm feeling so good. And he's like, oh no, sit down, we need to get you back in balance. And I was like, no, 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 this is my balance. I want to be like this all the time. <laughs> and he was like, no, sit down, we need to really you know, bring this back to the way it's supposed to be. So um, it was challenging for me to give up that state, I have to say. I was, just, I was like on top of the world, so unbelievably high. And um, yeah, now I'm very balanced. Uh, I and have then, to what, then, then what was it after that you were going to escape from? What was the greatest thing that happened to you when, you, when this guy decided, well, he was definitely making sure you're going to stay there, but you decided to stay there. So what was the greatest thing that happened to you in the next two or three days? I realize that there is a balance because, you know, my sensibility up until this point, and I've trained myself very well to, to be this way, is kind of black and white. There was never any gray. And that was my big concern when I came in. I said, I, I've worked very hard to be very clear in my life. It's yes or no. You know, there is no in between. And it was interesting. That was a red flag for him. He said, well, you're not in balance. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Of course I'm in balance. I'm, I have this complete clarity. Exactly what I need for myself. So that was hard for me so, to give So, up. Jamie, well, how would you respond to this? That uh, a lot of people say uh, that really everything in life is pretty much gray. It's not black and white. Well, I think that I understand that now. <laughs> that is more balance, and that's more about choice. Okay. But but I think up until that point, I've I've practiced myself into the having this complete clarity for myself, where either it resonates with me, it's either yes or it's no, and now I'm able to take a step back and and think about it in you know in a way that actually feels really good. Mm -hmm. So for me, this was um, this was a wonderful experience and. Um, I was so excited to share it with clients, and my brother has had both of his children, uh, two sons, one is 16, mm. the other one who's 10, they've gone through 22 sessions of the brain training and have had just amazing results. And he is a um, urologist, very skeptical, very um, science-based, very not interested in any of these, you know, weird technologies. And he is uh, just completely just blown away by how, you know, what <clears throat> this is for an option for people. So anyway, it's been <clears throat> life-changing for me. And um, I hope to work with more and more people after they've had this experience because then they're so open and receptive to what's going on in, in their now. You know, yeah. it's What's going on now? And life is really now. And we waste so much time about what was, and what was doesn't even matter. <laughs> so um, this was just brilliant, and I'm just, you know, feel blessed that we. <laughs> <laughs> so would you be, would you be, Jamie? Would you be willing to share the uh, the actual assessment um, when you found out? Uh, you know, I haven't done it, so um, I read up on it. But uh, I understand that you get a printout once uh, once the assessment is done. You get a printout, and you get to see it actually in black and white and shades of gray. How unbalanced your brain is? Did you did you have that experience? I was un very unbalanced, and it was very hard for me to believe I was so unbalanced because I was 
you know, I, f I feel so good all the time. But I realize that's also an imbalance. So um, yes, and by the end, I was in complete balance. And now I listen to my ambient sound, which is the birds, twice a day in the morning and at night. And, um, you know, I just feel like that recalibrates me. It, it's, it's really been um, helpful. So, yeah. Uh, Lee, can I ask you a question? Um, um, Jamie went for, a, I don't know, five days or whatever it was. How often should you go back or how often do you think you should feel that you should go back? Is there something goes on where you feel that, oh, I need to go back and get balanced again or I need to, is, is that what like, like they a tune, can do? Like a tune-up, you mean? Like a tune-up, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, like, um, you know, tune-ups um, tune are actually good periodically regardless, just to sort of clean out the system, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but there are times, too, in life when, when life doesn't seem to deal very fair with us. <laughs> and we, we not only know that something's not right, but it's right in our face, right? I mean, there can be major problems, car accidents, loss of loved ones, you know, etc. And when those traumas happen, if you don't recover from them, then that's the time to go back. If, you know, X number of weeks or days or weeks after, uh, you're, you're not recovered from that. Um, my mom died in January, at the end of January. And um, just before that, a couple days before that, I had looked at my balance in my brain because I was going to, ready to play golf. And so I wanted to make sure <laughs> I would be putting as well win. as I, I, I would be putting as well as I could. The day after I learned that she died, be, although she was 102, going almost 103, oh my goodness! St still, it was a surprise. And she was my best friend, and you know I loved her dearly. So the day after she died, I just went in to the our optimization center here had them hook me up, we looked at my brain, and it went from uh, being about at most two and a half percent anywhere differentiated left and right to being 68 percent differentiated. Wow. Is that a lot? Is that, I mean, yeah, it sounds that's a like lot. a lot. It sounds that like a lot, lot, but in figures it is a lot. Okay, okay. Yep. If um, 15 percent is quite a bit. And would you attribute that to the grief that you're yes. feeling and the emotion. So the emotion that you're feeling in your life, your body, resonated in also in, you know, because we're all connected, in the brain, and that was probably a reflection of that. I mean, because, you know, when we do lose a life, you know, a lifelong friend and our loved one, there is grief. Right, and there needs to be. Absolutely, and, yes. And so, and so what I did is I processed, you know, the time, uh, and then following the, her funeral, about two and a half weeks following her funeral, three weeks actually, I did it again. I looked at my brain again, and then it was in the 22% range, differentiated. Okay, well, what that means is that it's coming back. And as long as our brain patterns come back, then we're okay. You know, there's a natural balance state. Um, that they that they will seek if they're not stuck. But if they get stuck like a car, mm -hmm. eh, sorry. Um, you, you probably you've heard of Winona Judd, the country singer. Yeah. yeah. And she um, oh, and she's just on Dancing with Stars, by the way. Yeah, that's right. I was uh, going to say that. Yeah. Um, she was married last year, and her drummer is his uh, stage name is Cactus. Um, after that, they took a motorcycle ride. He swerved over in the uh, oncoming lane, head on a car that tore his leg off. Ooh, really? Oh, wow. And it, it almost tore his arm off. Ooh. So um, they, she called me from the hospital and said, what do I do? And I said, well, you don't, you don't have a choice here, you know. He, you have to have them go ahead and amputate. But then about six weeks after that, they were back in Nashville and they called and I went out. And his problem was with severe pain in the leg. There wasn't a leg to have severe pain in. There was no leg. Yeah. Well, isn't was, that called phantom was, pain? Phantom yeah, pain? Yeah. It, it was, in fact, phantom pain. Right. And we've seen 
from some guys coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan. And so I, when we looked at the brain, it was highly asymmetrical, highly imbalanced in one particular area. And when it came back to balance, which it did in one day for him, the pain was gone. Three weeks later, he was on a prosthesis. Now, that didn't have anything to do with his leg. It had to do with his brain. Absolutely. Yeah. To, to, to wear it, to put it on, yeah. Yeah, and now, and now, wow, well, now we're planning on the golf courses we're going to play, you know, later in the year. I mean, he's, he's you know. So would you call him a pretty quick recoverer? Because it sounds like this happened all in a very short time, that he got his act together very fast. He did, but he refused meds. Well, good uh, for him. <laughs> uh, well, the reason he did is because he had had issues with them before in his life. Oh, okay. So where he couldn't just kind of handle that. Well, he didn't want to go back there. He didn't want to, te try to, to tempt it. Mm -hmm. um, things, yeah, yeah I, I, I think, you know. But that was a very good choice on his part, but that was a very strong choice he had to make since he must have been in a lot of pain. He was. Yeah, to go through that, actually, and to take it all in and say, no, I'm not going to take the meds. I'm going to go through the pain. But, you know, what's so interesting is if you ha things that I responded to before the brain training, when I was done with the brain training, I didn't respond to those things at all the same way. There was no response. It was a choice how to respond. It was so clear to me that it was a choice. There was n nothing re like in a reflex response nothing That's so yeah oh so powerful in terms of the choice that you have and i think my family was actually a little confused because <laughs> <laughs> they they think, were, you got no feeling <laughs> well they were really just expecting the same response and there was no response i really had to pause and figure out how i wanted to respond and just there's such tremendous freedom in that in terms of moving forward with our lives so you and mean you weren't responding from your subconscious? You were responding. Not. You were you were responding from the present moment. From the present moment, mm -hmm. and sometimes you that requires a pause, which uh -huh. I was actually <laughs> fantastic <laughs> fighting before. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, fantastic. So, so Lee, for for a second, I want to just explore something about um, corporate consciousness and corporate business. I noticed that you have quite a quite a good sized staff at Brain State Technologies, and I'm curious, does everybody in the company um, has done the brain balancing, and how does it, <clears throat> how do you, do, do, you, do you feel that everybody's working together much, much better? What are the benefits if the answer is yes? And how would you compare that to previous experiences that you may have had working at different corporate um, uh, companies? Lack of competition. It's a whole different world when you when you find yourself pulling on the rope with people and not pulling against others in the company. And so um, what Jamie said was that her discernment improved so much. Yes, we do have our employees um, user process. And yes, we ask them to do that actually especially when they're working directly with clients, we ask, ask them to do it a little bit once a month because they, they, we face people that, we face a lot of ish, situations and problems. And you can't help but face those situations and problems every day in an, uh, you know, without it rubbing off on you a little bit. You pick up some of that trauma. As in the situation I was just talking about with Winona and her husband, and I can talk about this, and they've given me um, the right to do that, by the way, and she's also made it public on a documentary. But, you know, she had trauma too. She ran over to him when he was all bloody and in a ball and thought he was gone, and she had just pledged her life to him. Then he gets out of the hospital. And now this isn't the same person she married just 30 days ago. Now the whole world has changed. And something she didn't sign up for. <laughs> you know? yeah. Right? Mm. And, and so, wow. Um, we have the opportunity to make changes if our brain isn't stuck. 
And we are extremely powerful in terms of doing that without being stuck. But with being stuck, we're going to have other stuff come up that's going to get in our way. And so our employees do work. We also give our employees a benefits for their friends and family because we want them healthy. <laughs> you know, we don't just want our employees uh, you know, healthy, but we want their friends and family healthy so that they can, in fact, um, you know, share, share that power, if you will, share that life force. When we do that, there's a lot of collaboration, very little competition. Wow. And Lee, will this work on somebody that is closed-minded? Um, you know, my son and I decided that in the, in, You have somebody in mind? The, yes, my in, husband. In, <laughs> in the early stages of our de, uh, technology development, our son and I, my son and I de decided we had to choose, uh, make a, we were at a crossroads sort of, and we had to make a turn. We didn't know whether to invest very strongly in the underlying technology or invest very strongly in the show and tell side of the technology first. Because, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to check to see what the placebo effect was of the technology. We thought about how to do that and not being smart enough to figure that out, we decided we would just take, um, open up the technology to some adolescents who were in juvenile detention. <laughs> Good. Good <laughs> I, I love that laugh. She got it. She knows what I mean. So if they're going to change, you know, it is not going to be because they believe it. <laughs> and so um, we would take them out of lockup uh, with their, um, with a counselor and one of their parents, bring them to the office, you know, they would often give us a one-finger salute. Um, and I would say, you don't have to do anything, but you do have to do one thing. I am going to let you sit down in a comfortable chair, because if Juvie lock up, there is no chair. There's nothing, by the way. I will let you sit in a comfortable chair. You can even sleep, but you sit there, and you shut up, and you be still. That's the deal. <laughs> How would you like? <laughs> and give him a pop. <laughs> and, so, and so we hooked him up, and not one of those first five left this office after three sessions without hugging me. Oh, wow. How powerful that is. Now, today, the, a place in Canada has a juvenile um, treatment center for uh, violent adolescents that they're receiving recommendations from all over Canada, and now some from the United States too. They use our stuff. And they said, but Lee, some of these guys are so bloody ornery, we can't even get, get them to sit in the chair. And I said, that's okay. Let, let them go to bed and then just hook them up at night. <laughs> wow. Do you know, this would be a great thing to that's have in juvenile good. hall. Yeah, that's what- To that's have this in juvenile. I did, lots, I did a lot of shows, I used to do a kid's show. And I did a lot of shows in juvenile hall and filmed all these kids, oh, yeah. the, not their faces. And the stories are amazing. And this would be so great to have in there and help these kids. Yes. Well, you know, what came to me as Ninon was saying that, and Lee, you brought up a really great, or actually an outstanding example of, you know, like adolescents that are in trouble. What about our prison system? I mean, that, I mean, we just had a horrible thing happen here in Colorado where we had a gentleman that was in prison and he was in trouble all the time. And, he got out and he killed our, our um, who was it, the director of the department? The director, uh, yeah. Right, right, horribly. And then I'm wondering what that would do with our inmates that are that wild and crazy. I mean, that would be we an went, interesting example or research or something. We went to Nevada six years ago and we worked in their medium uh, security prison. That's where the inmates were being staged to go to maximum security. That's where they're put in a six by six cage separated. Mm. because of their violence. So we went to the medium security area and the state of Nevada Correctional Department chose um, a half a dozen of those inmates that we were going to uh, work with. Um, 
I was kind of like a puppy. You know how the puppy will come up to you and just wag its tail and, <laughs> you know, and so. Jump, jump around and love you. <laughs> yeah. So I walked through the door the first day and then that gate clanged behind me. Oops. The third gate. So much for the puppy. <laughs> I'm trapped. <laughs> and I, I realized I was in a yard with, you know, approximately 300 men all of whom were bigger, stronger, and faster than, and more violent than me. And I thought, hmm, huh. <laughs> let's what? see, I have from here to there, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that no was, place to go. You know, really balanced my brain is. <laughs> <laughs> Those inmates that we worked with, none of them could read. They could read the words. Uh, we gave them a third grade reader that was part of the before and after test. They could read, you know, see, Jane lived in a house. Jane had a backyard. Jane played with her puppy in the backyard. Jane threw the ball. The puppy brought the ball back to Jane. That was it. So you'd say, they'd read it, and then you'd say to themselves, you'd say, where did Jane live? Did she live in an apartment? What did Jane have? Did she have a doll? I mean, they read the, and they could read the words aloud to you even. But and they, they couldn't could, answer. They couldn't uh, answer. They couldn't retain anything. Wow. Yeah. Those inmates were 252% on the average differentiated between left and right hemispheres. Wow. On the average. But that's why they do what they do. Exactly. And so, because they're unbalanced. Exactly. And they were in a freeze state. And when you're in a freeze state, one of the best ways to get out of that freeze state is rage. Of course. And that's, and that's what brought them into that system. Mm -hmm. They had five years of no violent act after we left. And then they probably needed a tune-up about five years, like we all do. I, I haven't checked oh. on that. Okay. Um, I think but, sooner than that. <laughs> five but, years. But there's no violent act. You see, that's the most violent environment in history. Oh, it that's, is. So Horrible. It's, it's more so than Iraq or Afghanistan. You're trapped. You got. You have no place to go. You've just got. Yeah, prison you're trapped. Walls, exactly. And you and you have no choices. They've so, been all so, taken away. So I think so, this is. You, you you just all touched on this actually. That's kind of interesting. Is that. We seem to have we seem to have like um, a maintenance program for pretty much everything, including our bodies. Like we go exercise, we do all, all this stuff, uh, including our cars have a maintenance program. Everything has a maintenance program except our brain. Um, That's debatable. Well, yeah. what's, it what's what's your maintenance program <laughs> for your brain? I read. That keeps it alive, right? Oh, I don't, think that's, I, don't think that's a I don't think that's a maintenance program. You don't think so? No. Okay. I, I, I think reading can be helpful to bring in new ideas. I think meditation is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think um, communing somehow, exercise is really helpful. And nature is hugely helpful. Yes, I think so too. I think that oh. creates a lots of well-being for us and can create balance even if it's temporary. But how many and people do that? You know, that's funny. Get out of town. My fa yeah, and, mother and, and father. And that, and that was going to be my point, yeah, is that how many people meditate in this country? Yeah, all, all of us. Know. Yeah, all of us. All of us here, but yeah. on, a, on a large scale. I don't think most people know how to meditate, and no. I think there was a reasoning of how, how to... People go, well, how do I meditate? People just don't know, and I think if they knew how to meditate, they would. But, but I, you know, this is the other thing. I think that even though this technology is available and hopefully more and more people will learn about it and they will have the opportunity to experience it. And the other thing that is very appealing about it is the cost. It was very reasonable in terms of what the cost was for this um, brain training, um, which makes it certainly more available to most people. But I don't believe that we believe that... Um, Feeling good is uh, an option. And I think people mm. uh, need permission to buy into that belief that yeah. we can feel good. And 
it's okay and we're okay. And I think that message um, somehow is not getting across. Uh, well, the, the, the norm, the norm, Jamie, and, and I'd like Lee to get into this. Um, the norm is violence and killing. Mm. That's what, when you turn on the television, that's what we're being fed. Well, let me say something. They did, my nephew, who did have the brain training, did some experiments with uh, violent video games before and after his brain training. And I have to say that when his brain was in balance, the violent video games did not impact his brain the same way it did when his brain was out of balance which was yep. very interesting. So when we have a balanced brain, we are able to um, interact with all kinds of things, technology, violence, and we process it differently. So if we could recreate and, and maintain the balance, I think that whatever it is that we were necessarily exposed to or chose to expose ourselves to, we would uh, process that differently. And what do you mean by differently? What what we, would, we wouldn't, uh, it would not um, throw us off balance because we would already be in balance at the onset of the experience as opposed to being off balance and then looking for that experience to bring us back to balance. The okay, so idea... let, me just, let, me just, let me just get to a specific example because that seems to work. So the fact that all of, our, all of our kids are growing up with violent games that's full of... Um, shooting <laughs> with guns and now we have the conversation of guns in the news 24 7 right? at least and at seven least, days a week at least so we are being bombarded everywhere um 24 7 about this how much of that has to do with the fact that somebody may go into a theater and start shooting <clears throat> people no, it has nothing to do with it because it has, has nothing to, be to do with it. Extremely out I, of balance. I can't believe that. Okay, Lee, I need, out of balance I need some feedback here. Like <laughs> yeah, I, have, I have a question. The fact that violence. we are being programmed for violence has no. nothing to do with that? I don't believe that. I believe that we're already out of balance and we are using that. Um, like cocaine or any other thing that we become addicted to is we are looking for that to bring us back into balance and it's clearly it's not working but i don't believe that video games creates people to go out and kill anybody no i don't but, but let me ask this question here um and when somebody has in their head they're now going to go out and buy a gun now if you're going to go and buy a gun your intention is to use that gun you're going to kill something with it so that's put into their brain on why they're going to buy the gun. Otherwise, they wouldn't buy the gun. And yes, we say no. to protect ourselves. Uh, I don't know about that. I, I think, I believe... The intention Jamie, is to, to kill something. I believe Jamie has it right. I, I think, I believe that. I think that if we look at one of the instances, if we look at the Newtown shooting, that young man... Um, killed his mother first, and then he went on the rampage, uh, killing people uh, where she worked. She was a gun lover, and therefore he had access to those guns, right? Yes. And, and that access mattered in this case. If True. he wouldn't have had access, he, he that, you know, we wouldn't have had this happen the same way. Uh, he may have stabbed her. Okay, he may. And have there were bought. also swords and and other kinds of. Uh, there were uh, <clears throat> knives and swords in the house as well too. Yeah, and he okay. didn't stab her. So, 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 when, so hang on. I never got a response from Lee. Lee, you were just quiet there uh, <laughs> regarding all of this programming that we're getting. Um, from television and games, how, how, what effect does that have on our brain? I'm willing to be I, wrong. I think, I think it can have an effect. Um, I don't know the extent of that effect, but what happens is that those who are strongly, you know, um, out of balance take it to the next level of chaos. And those are the instances that we hear so much about then. And then that adds fuel to the proverbial fire that, that you know, there's, there's, something so, there's something so wrong. And there is something wrong. You know, there, 
there, ha there has to be. There is that, something off, Lee. There's something off, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and if, if, if I feel that there's something off strongly enough, I may feel like I need protection. And, um, and so I might go buy a weapon. If, um, and, and why would I feel that way? Well, I would feel that way because I see or experience that quote unquote something off um, from a larger, in the larger population. So, so it, it's a complicated issue. So, so here's, kind of here's proof, that. here's proof for you. Okay, I'll give you proof. Okay, so right now in Colorado, because this, this is in a conversation 24 seven, mm -hmm. it takes, it mm -hmm. used to take 24 to 48 hours to get a permit. Now it takes three months. Really? There is your proof. Yes. A permit for what? A permit. To, oh, to have a gun. You're well, kidding. What, do you, what are we proving? Proof of what? What I'm proving is because it's in the conversation, because conversation is that powerful. People are running out and buying, buying guns, and they can't buy them fast enough. But what, are they buying them uh, with the intention of killing someone? That's what, that's I, what my I have, thing is. I have no idea. That's not the proof that well, I why was, would you buy a gun? I was looking for. I, w I was well, looking for giving you proof that... When this conversation is, is in the media and it's, everybody's talking about, um, you know, the government is taking away our freedom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, everybody needs to have, you know, needs to have a gun. And now people are buying guns that never even thought about buying one for the last decade. Uh, but I would like to they're they, unbalanced. They are, they're buying <laughs> guns. Unbalanced. Those people that are buying guns for whatever reason they're buying, they're, those are not the people that are going to ever be using those guns. Th that's a very different idea than someone who is going to buy a gun with the intention of killing somebody. Well, we don't, we don't, it's we don't, very different. We don't know that. Yes. I think, well, I think we Lee... do know it because if you look at the statistics for how many people in this country own a gun, and then you look at the statistics for how many people use those guns to kill people, you will see very clearly that there is a greater proportion of people who own guns than people who use guns to kill people. In England, we well, don't have this problem. I, I, in think, England, we, I, think, in I think Lee was touching on that earlier, is that it depends, you know, all this information that's coming into our brain, and, and based on how unbalanced we are, that has a lot to do with who's going to actually take action. Is that correct, Lee? Yes. When we, in my book, Limitless You, I talk about this young man that came to us and we did an assessment and we saw a strong asymmetry in an area that would generally indicate that he'd either had a traumatic brain injury or he had had a, a very early life, perhaps a fetal trauma. He was brought to us, he was deemed uh, that we had to come to us from the court. They caught him in a, he was about 16 and a half, they caught him in a parking lot using meth and so they searched, they arrested him and they searched his car. In his car, they found a notebook. In the notebook, he had defined each person's name that he was going to kill. Mm. And he had talked about where he had placed his firearms, hid his firearms for that to happen. Um, and they found that that was true. He had stashed them. Okay. Was now, that because... So, what, oh. <clears throat> All right, so, so when we looked, we found this large asymmetry... <laughs> Uh, actually, it's 125 or 45 percent. I don't remember now. We the asymmetry changed. He himself couldn't believe that he had ever thought that. See, that's because of the drugs. What, what in the bloody drugs? world was I thinking of? No, well, it's because of the imbalance, not okay. because of the drugs. <laughs> yes. It was because the of the brain imbalance. imbalance. Okay. And the drugs did not create brain imbalance. The trauma created brain imbalance. My, my dear imbalance. cast, we are running out of time. <laughs> Sorry, so, not time so, <laughs> so guess what? Here's, here's what's coming to me right now. Okay, so I think, I think what could be really useful is to take something out of everyday, our everyday lives and then give you some examples. One example would be the divorce rate. There is, you know, what's the divorce rate? 53%? Probably. Uh, in this country. Something so, like that. so what about what about doing doing a trial where we could have uh, people's people's brain balanced and make it a make it a requirement for a group of people before they get married. That would be no fun. <laughs> and, and see <laughs> and see what happens with the statistics. Oh. 
That'd be boring. I, I think that would be um, interesting. <laughs> I don't know if you've got an answer. <laughs> and, it would be, and it would be quite useful because who ends up paying for all these divorces is the kids. Right. Yes. When, when we have people that come to us in an abusive relationship, the abused has a very strong left temporal lobe dominance. The abuser, if he or she comes in later, and they usually do, or there's a divorce, by the way, Lee, because, I gotta wrap it up. I got like a minute left. Okay. <laughs> well, so the other, next the other time, party has a high thank, right symmetry. Thank so. you. And I, you know, we didn't cover, you know, one third of the stuff I wanted to cover. So here we go. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Lee. Uh, we really enjoyed having you here. It's a thank fascinating you. conversation, fascinating science. I'm, I loved every minute of it. Thank you, the entire cast, the people behind the glass door, especially Ann and Bill. And all of our viewers, thank you very much for tuning in. Go to livingconsciously.tv, uh, check us out, uh, comment on the show, ask questions, do all that stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, I love you all. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Lee. Bye. Great. Thank, thank you, you all. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Okay.